Today's video is partially sponsored by Outs. Outs is a growing general store, providing essential items for those out active. Their featured item, this rechargeable lighter. In case you run out of fuel, keep this around and it will solve your problem. It's windproof and comes with waterproof protection in case it gets wet. Get your rechargeable lighter. It's $20, links in the description. Not going to waste any time in between, let's get into the story. Before we start, here's an honorable mention, Kemba Walker. Kemba Walker is an NBA player from the Soundview houses. If you are from the Bronx, you might have caught him at the Gauchos or Dykeman, putting on shows around the New York City street ball circuit. He was cooking in high school, breaking records at Rice, which he attended. Shout out to him. Today, we are doing an outline of the origin and demise of SMM aka, Sex Money Murder. They are documented as one of the most infamous crews of the 90s, and until this day, hold sway in the gang culture. The crew originated in the Soundview Houses. Soundview Houses had often feuded with their rivals in the nearby, Castle Hill Houses. These crews would later unify in furtherance of the drug trade. Modern day New York, they are known as the Trendies. In this story, we are particularly talking about the first generation SMM crew, and what led to the murder of David Mullins, aka, Twin. Twin was a member of the crew, but was killed by his own gang. Why did this happen? Was it jealousy? Was it betrayal? Was it a righteous kill? The murder of Twin was ordered by no other than Pistol Pete himself, the leader of SMM. In his early days, Peter Rollick got his name, Pistol Pete, from an older dude who knew that Pete had a reputation of carrying two small caliber handguns. In one situation, Twin was unarmed rolling dice against a dude named Cato at Harlem Week. Pete shot Cato dead when he threatened Twin with a gun. While many thought he already had bodies under his belt, this would actually be Pete's first murder. Twin exhibited his loyalty for Pete as well, murdering on two occasions. In one situation, Twin shot dead a man in a club who allegedly put a hit out on Pete. Pistol Pete's prison nightmare began in late 1995 when he was arrested at Grant's tomb in Harlem for murder. While locked up, he began sending letters to multiple members of the gang, letting them know that Twin was triple nine. Triple nine meant that Twin was snitching. That was a no-no. But was Twin really snitching? This story can be compared to that of Rich Porter and Alpo, famous drug dealers from Harlem. Although the flashiness of the SMM crew is not documented to the level of Harlem guys, the stories are pretty similar. Two guys who were on the same side, and one gets knocked off. Someone who was well liked in their community. Before we get into the details of the murder, let us dive into the original players involved. Now, before they were known as SMM, they were just a bunch of young dudes putting on in their hood. Whether it was beef with rival crews, or internal conflicts caused by the coming of age and split between younger and older generations, they began to make a name for themselves. Pete was about 14 when the crew started to ring some bells. The original members weren't initiated or anything, just a couple of guys who liked sex, money, and murder. In fact, one of Pete's cousins, an LA Crip, inspired the name SMM. In 1992, in a conversation, he told Pete and others that gang culture was different on the West, more structured, while guys on the East, pertaining to crews such as Pete's, only cared about sex, money and murder, hence the name. Pete was about 18 at the time. They had a name before the crew before this that wouldn't stick. Pistol Pete was the first to pretty much mobilize the rest of the crew, making him the leader. His father was a gangster and also had connections to the mob in his times. Pistol Pete, like most young guys whose dads had reputations in the street, wanted to emulate just that. Pipe was his younger homie, who would go on to be his most trusted subordinates, more like a brother than a friend. He met Pete at a cousin's house, and despite being 3-4 years younger, they got along. Pipe would frequent Pete's crib, and Pete would indoctrinate Pipe with his gangsterism. When Pipe was 11 years old, he committed his first shooting in the Lafayette houses on behalf of Pete, popping shots from a 9-shot revolver. Shog was another original member. He would serve as the point man for the murder of Twin. Shog got his name from Baby J, an established dealer from the projects that would later put Shog in the drug game out of town. Although he was bussing moves, he always spins Soundview to check his grandmoms and politic with the guys. In 1986, Shog and Pistol Pete played on a local league football team, scoring touchdowns together. It was that year that they built upon their relationship. 
Shog was the first person to bring Pistol Pete to the projects and actually introduce him to others. At the time, Pete was living with his grandmother in a house right outside the projects. Shog didn't start off per se a gangster, but wouldn't back down from a fight. One of his early OGs would pay him to handle disputes with guys his OG was too old to put hands on. Fat Mike and his crew was getting money on Cozy Corner and Soundview. Located on Randall Avenue between Commonwealth and Rosedale, Cozy Corner was dangerous, and most wouldn't dare go over there at night. You had your essential stores, and in the 70s, it housed a club called Cozy Corner. Fat Mike would look out for Shog, keeping him in line, like a big brother. Fat Mike would die in a gruesome triple murder. In January 1988, five dudes were in Sam's apartment, 7F, on the top floor of the seven-story building. The five guys. Sam, the owner of the apartment, Fat Mike, the smooth cat, Derek, as well as Stymie and Baldy. Some of them were using cocaine, bagging up crack, a regular day for a dealer. Around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, there was a knock at the door. When they opened the door, it was a familiar face, Kirk, who threatened them with a shotgun. At that moment, he motioned the other few gunmen to proceed into the apartment. Armed with shotguns and handguns, the assailants forced the five men into the bedroom. They were forced to remove their clothes. The authorities said they did not know why the men had been forced to strip, but suspected it was to ensure that the victims were unarmed. Some of them had their genitals exposed. The assailants shot the five naked men, killing three of them, Fat Mike, the smooth cat, Derek and lastly, Baldy, who was a low-profile hustler. The other two, Sam and Stymie, were taken to Jacoby Hospital in the Bronx and survived their bullet wounds. Cops discovered Fat Mike's jewelry stuffed in his socks, and the apartment was filled with blood and crack valves. This event would rock Soundview, it changed the game. All bets were off and if people couldn't get to you, then they would come for your family. At that point, if you had a gun, it was intended for use. No more scaring people with pop shots, because now, people were shooting back. The triple homicide set a new standard in the Soundview projects. The guys that committed the murders were getting money in the Sackworn houses. They were known as Leary's crew. They had been selling on Cozy Corner, and Lester, who controlled Cozy Corner, didn't want Leary's crew in the area. After the triple homicide, Leary got low due to Stymie's cooperation with the government, and Lester allegedly fled for a while, in fear that he was next to get boomed. This left the drug market open, which Pete and his crew would eventually fill. Pete would recruit the young guys that were willing to put in work and get money. At some point, Leary would come back, and the coming-of-age war would take place. We are not detailing that part of the story, but basically, the young guys would force the older ones to concede, surrendering the projects. Surely, Leary's crew felt Pete's crew was reckless, mind you, Pete was the oldest, around 16 years old. Shootings, murders, robberies and kidnappings took place as a result, and Pete's crew took over and established themselves in projects. There were other members to mention, like Bear and his little brother, Little Bear. There was Big Ant, Pete's bodyguard, and Ro Ro, who was Pipe's little brother. You had Mac 11, who would participate in the twin murder along with another member, Green Eyes. You had Jazz the Total Package, a high-ranking enforcer, as well as Nut, who would go on to commit a murder. You had B Love, who was there from Jump, and Yarrow Pack, who was getting money before he even got with Pete. There was Mo, and there was also Bimo, who was from the rival Castle Hill houses, but sanctioned in the view. He was the first immediate member to catch a body out of the crew, which took place during the coming-of-age war against Leary. Although Bimo's father used crack, he was what you would call back then, a functional crackhead. Since crack was new at that time, there wasn't any stigma of a crackhead, and they came in different types. Here's a fun fact. Bimo's father, also named Bimo, is allegedly responsible for the slang word, Mo. In the Bronx, you may hear someone refer to someone they know as, Mo. Like, chill Mo, stop playing Mo, what's good Mo? Get it, that slang originated in Soundview. Initially, the crew used it to identify each other while staying anonymous to outsiders. Twin, and his twin brother was from the Castle Hill houses. They were popular and well-liked. As Pete began to rise in the drug game, he put high school beasts aside and joined forces with Twin, who controlled most of the drug trade in the Castle Hill houses. Twin and Pete were similar, as they both didn't drink or smoke, and moved militantly. Twin was already moving kilos on his own. He too, would also display his loyalty to Pete through murder. Between this time, and Twin's demise, as you can conclude, the crew was ruthless. 
A notable murder was the Carlton Hines murder. Carlton Hines was from Kirtland Avenue and repped the Melrose Projects. He was getting a lot of money, making 50000 a day, and inherited the name, Seat Town. This isn't his story, but we have to mention it based on his notoriety. Allegedly, Pete and his crew encountered Carlton and his crew at the Skate Key on Allerton Avenue. Pete tried to greet Carlton. Carlton, who might not have known or mistakenly misidentified Pete, said who the F are you? Whether it was pride or impulse, Pete punched Carlton and a scuffle broke out. Twin was in attendance and was involved in the fight. After being kicked out the skate key, they went to get their guns from the whips. The presence of police would calm the situation. This event would result in a series of attempts by Pete to catch Carlton slipping. Accounts say that Carlton wasn't on it like that. Of course he had to watch his back but didn't really want to war with Pete. He was about getting money, chicks, and basketball as he was a street ball legend before becoming a drug kingpin. He is one of the only people to dominate hood basketball and the drug game, similar to Pee Wee Kirkland. In 1994, at age 25, Carlton Hines would be killed by Pistol Pete at a car wash in the Bronx. B.O. was known for knocking people out and is considered a Bronx River and Kirtland Avenue street legend. He and Carlton Hines were friendly and getting money together. When they were younger, Shog took B.O. under the wing and was the first person to put a gun in his hand. They went on drills together and were associates in the drug game. Now, because of the murder of Hines, B.O. seeked revenge. Besides the murders, there was the high life. There was jewelry and the clubs. There were the trips to Virginia and the jet skis. The stacks of money, the girls, and the rubbing of shoulders with those in the entertainment industry. On one occasion, Pete and the crew went to meet Diddy at the club to discuss business. That business would manifest into Lord Tariq and Peter Guns, although Diddy never signed them. They are rappers who would make the hit song, Deja Vu, aka, Uptown Baby. Peter Guns is also the father of rapper, Corey Guns. I think everyone knows this. Anyway, there was connections to Tupac and Biggie Smalls. One time, Pete had to deter Bimo from attempted to rob Biggie for a Rolex. Pete was also friendly with Tyson Beckford. One night inside the Manhattan disco, when Pipe felt disrespected by the rapper, Nas, he broke a bottle of Cristal over the rapper's head. When bouncers hurried over, Nas refused to point out Pipe. The rapper knew the code and the cost for breaking it. Before Pete would be hit with life sentences, he had aspirations to launder his money through the music industry and to become a mogul himself. In the early 1990s, Euro Pack became associated with Pistol Pete in the Bronx. During that same time period, Yarrow Pack was involved in cocaine and crack cocaine distribution in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pete began accompanying Yarrow Pack on the trips to Pittsburgh in late 1993 and 1994. Together, they were transporting 8 to 10 kilograms of cocaine powder and crack cocaine at a time. Pete served as a lookout on the trips to Pittsburgh and was paid $3,000 to $5,000 per trip. In 1994, Yarrow Pack and David met in the Bronx, and David pitched Yarrow Pack about the potential for distributing drugs in North Carolina. As a result of this conversation, Yarrow Pack, Pete, David, and Pipe began making trips to North Carolina in a lease Nissan Quest van carrying drugs. On the second trip, Yarrow Pack, Pete and David met in New York and drove the van, containing 6 to 8 kilograms of cocaine, to North Carolina. During this trip the men sold cocaine in Rockingham and Lumberton, North Carolina, as well as somewhere in South Carolina. They then drove to Charlotte, North Carolina, where Yarrow Pack and Pete were introduced by David to Evans. David, Evans, Yarrow Pack and Pete discussed opening crack houses in Charlotte and developing customers for their drug business. After this trip, Yarrow Pack, Pete and David decided to return to New York temporarily. They left the van at the airport and flew to New York for a few days. At the time, the van contained about 100,000 and about 2 kilograms of cocaine. Yarrow Pack then flew down to pick up the van in order to return it to New York. The third and final trip to North Carolina also began in New York. Yarrow Pack, David, Pete, and Pipe left New York in the leased van. The van had Pennsylvania license plates and contained approximately 8 to 10 kilograms of cocaine powder and crack cocaine. In Pittsburgh, they collected money and delivered approximately 6 kilograms of cocaine. The price of each kilo went for about 30,000. A portion of the drugs they distributed in Pittsburgh were Yarrow Packs, while the rest were Pete's. 
from Pittsburgh, they drove to Lumberton to collect money on a drug debt and then to South Carolina to collect more drug money and deliver more drugs. From there, they drove to Rockingham to meet with a customer of theirs, Darius Covington. In Rockingham they met with Covington, who owed them between $80,000 to $90,000 for cocaine he had previously received. However, Covington was unable to pay the full amount owed. Pete was very upset. While tapping a gun against his own head, Pete told Europac and David, Yo, I'm going in there and murder him. In response to David please, Pete agreed that Covington would have one more day to come up with the remaining money owed. As the four men had plans to drive to Charlotte for the evening, they agreed to meet with Covington when they returned the next day. From Rockingham, the four men drove to Charlotte for a concert. They still had about two or three kilos of cocaine in the van and a gun. Allegedly, they attended a concert before going to a motel inn in Lumberton. Pete hit up Twin, who had clientele in the area. He figured Twin could help him knock off the remaining keys. Twin would arrive in Lumberton the following day, and they drove to Wilmington, North Carolina to deliver more cocaine. Pipe stayed with Twin to sell the keys, while Pete, Yarrow Pack, and David returned to Rockingham the next day to meet with Covington. When they returned to Rockingham on October 21, 1994, David Page Covington to make arrangements as to where to meet. It was agreed that they'd meet in a local fast food restaurant. However, Covington never arrived. Unbeknownst to Pete, David had phoned Covington and warned him that Pete intended to murder him. David then urged Pete and Yarrow Pack to leave Rockingham because Covington was not likely to arrive and pay his drug debt. Pete refused. Ain't nobody going to live in this world who owe me money. Pete insisted that they drive over to Covington's house because I'm going to murder his wife and kids. I ain't playing. While the three men were considering what to do next, law enforcement officers appeared and detained Yarrow Pack, David and Pete. The officers had been tipped by an informant that drugs were being transported into Richmond County, North Carolina, in a burgundy Nissan Quest bearing Pennsylvania license plates and occupied by three individuals. It was this tip which led the officers to detain the three men. Turns out that Covington was an informant. The officers then proceeded to search the van. At the time they were detained, each of the three used an alias. Yero Pack used the name Corey Hines, David used David Richards, and Pete used Nathaniel Tucker. During the initial search of the van, the officers failed to locate the drugs, money and the firearms, which were located within a secret compartment. However, two drug narcotics detection canines were brought to the scene. When the dogs alerted on the van, officers moved the van to another location, where a search was conducted pursuant to a search warrant. Yarrow Pack, David and Pete were transported to the police station without being placed under arrest. After providing false identification to the authorities, the three were released. They discussed among themselves whether to wait in Rockingham until the van was released or to flee the city, because the officers might locate the secret compartment which contained the drugs, money and guns. Pete urged them to stay. While using a payphone to notify their associates in New York of their plight, the three were arrested. They were taken to the sheriff's department and eventually placed under high bonds. Pete's uncle and Yarrow Pack's cousin provided bond money and the three were able to bond out of jail several days later. Yarrow Pack never returned to North Carolina to face his charges, nor did he make any subsequent drug trips to North Carolina. Meanwhile, after three weeks of bumping cocaine, Pipe and Twin returned to New York. It was shortly after this when Twin would commit his first murder. Twin, Pipe, and Pete would go to Club Sweetwaters between Midtown and the Upper West Side. With the assistance of a Queens drug associate, they were able to get in the club with their guns. A rival drug dealer named Frisky was in the spot as well. Frisky had initially established the drug connection with David and Covington in the South. Allegedly, he had paid a hitman from the Carolinas to murder Pete for taking over his business. Confusingly, upon their encounter with Frisky, Frisky was friendly. The crew played along with Frisky, even offering him champagne. The crew briefly discussed that they were going to rock Frisky to sleep. This was a common tactic used by SMM. They would make you feel like everything is good money, then when the subjects lets their guard down, they strike. Indeed, that would happen. As Pete, Pipe, and Twin surrounded Frisky, Twin would pull out a gun and shoot him point-blank in the head. When other club goers recognized the body laid out on the ground, everyone fled. There was never a trace of the alleged hitman. A couple of months later, it became known that there was 50,000 on B.O.'s head. B.O. was still talking retaliation, and members of the crew were on the lookout for him. 
Stephen Shog, who was locked up for crime out of town and had once mentored B.O., was hoping to claim the bounty. The bounty was set by the main drug connect for SMM, Castro, who was being extorted by B.O. Pete encountered B.O. one time by a club, but B.O. spotted Pete's attempted pursuit and fled. The next time he was spotted was by Dula, a SMM member. He let Pete and Twin know that B.O. was in the vicinity of the Castle Hill Avenue. Both Pete and Twin competed to get to the scene. Twin would reach B.O. first though. A single shot from a few feet away would crash into the head of B.O. and another shot would enter his chest. Twin was able to escape. During the summer of 95, Pete made the daily news as the most wanted in the Bronx. Unbeknownst to the police at the time, he had already committed murders. After being mentioned in the daily news, he upped the security. He kept a few stick men, like Big Ant, just in case somebody tried something. The Cato murder was two years prior and Harlem Week was coming up again. Twin would attend the Harlem Week and convinced Pete to come, claiming it was lit out there. Pete came through, jumped in the whip with Twin, but dipped off when he seen a shorty he knew among the crowd. Somebody noticed him from the Wanted article in the, the Daily News and alerted police. Pete tried to get low, throwing his gun into the crowd as he tried to smoothly evade the cops. They would apprehend him though, Pete surrendering, putting his hands up. Someone from the crowd brought forth a discarding gun. While Pete was locked up, Pipe became the successor of the crew. He would eventually get locked up for an attempt murder. It was in retaliation of a robbery and assault committed against him by a man named Brown. Anyway, during this time, Pipe pled guilty and he would be in the island, along with Pete. Although, he wasn't houses with Pete, he would deliver messages through members such as B-Love, who would visit both Pipe and Pete. Pete was upset Pipe had retaliated against Brown because he didn't have someone as solid as him on the outside. While imprisoned, Pete would cross paths with Omar and the Bloods. Many have their opinions on why or how the following events take place. Omar had already established the eight Trey Bloods. He approached Pete, wanting to unify with Pete and SMM. He had already gotten other deadly crews to unify under the Bloods. Pete refused because they already had enough influence and Pete himself had done more dirt in the streets the Omar. Omar would approach Pete again. This time he came with a more enticing offer. He offered Pete a partnership, an opportunity to own the streets and the prisons. He would grant Pete his own independence set, having the freedom to govern itself or control its own affairs. This was enough to convince Pete. The merge would cause an immense change, bringing much benefit in prison, as SMM didn't have much numbers in the Bing. Some say, Pete did this because he didn't have any protection to begin with and was pressured to team up with Omar. Others disagree, because if this was so, then why would SMM be granted an independent set? This is for the comments. Moving along. Pete would soon come home on two-week bail. Twin sister was cooperating with police when she was asked to pick Pete out of the lineup. When Twin found out, he threatened to kill his sister, which would cause her to recant her statement. This would disintegrate the murder case, leaving Pete to only face gun charges. He had also told Shog, who was also recently released from prison, that SMM was a blood set and allegedly established an alternate name, Blazing Billy. Bimo would catch his second body, this time on behalf of Baby, while Shog did another short stink for drug charges. Meanwhile, Pete went back to court after two-week bail and was hit with two to six years for the gun charge. That was bearable until 1996, when he was later hit with charges that came from the North Carolina situation. He was indicted for conspiracy to distribute cocaine and committing a violent crime while in possession of a gun. It became apparent that he was under investigation and was facing federal charges. At this time, Baby J and Shog would fall out and Bimo would fall out with Baby J as well. In addition to robbing Baby J's affiliates, Shog would attempt to kill Baby J, shooting at him. Pete found out that Baby J had became a crip. He now had a good reason to push the issue to knock off Baby J, as he never liked him anyway. Although Shog had always been cool with Pete, this situation would solidify his alliance with SMM. Shog and Pete spoke a lot on the phone during this time Pete was incarcerated. From this point, Pete would never touch the streets again. He began to create the provisions for the SMM Blood's power structure, based on the system used by the Mafia crime families. He would constantly send letters from jail, filled with blood codes, which were read aloud amongst the Bloods in the projects. Yarrow Pack was still on the streets. He was still in the drug game, and he and Twin would partner up. 
Twin would fill Pete's role and build an infrastructure far more sophisticated than it was when Pete was on the street. He partnered with a dude named Nelson and built up the organization. Unlike Pete, he was humble, drove a low-profile car, and treated those around him equal. He was in favor and had many supporters in both Castle Hill and Soundview projects. On the flip side of things, Pete was hearing about all this and may have caused him to feel that his reputation was being diminished by twins. Also, it was said that twin wasn't kicking in any money to Pete's moms. It was also said that twin was messing with one of Pete's chicks or baby moms. While this was going on, a letter came down from Pete stating that twin was a snitch and that twin didn't want Pete to come home. There were mixed emotions. Some questioned it, as they felt that Twin was loyal to Pete, even threatening his own sister on his behalf. But who knows, only Pete knows and whoever has the paperwork detailing this. Anyway, Shog was contacted by Pete to commit the murder. Bear, who was also a SMM member, ordered the crew to stand down against Twin. It was said that Bear felt that Pete was just jealous and Twin wasn't snitching. We won't know if that's the truth from his mouth today, because Bear died in an accident leading up to the planning of the murder. He was really the only one with enough status on the street to hold down or persuade guys to spare Twin. Pipe, who was incarcerated and was a high-ranking blood due to the merge, tried to reach his younger brother, Roe. He pleaded with Roe to not go against Twin in a letter, which was also read aloud. Roe would ultimately vow to fulfill Pete's orders over those of his brothers. After receiving the news that that Twin was cooperating, Pipe too had doubts. He didn't believe that this was the truth, as he had committed crimes with both Twin and Pete present, and Twin wasn't on his paperwork. Pipe had also spoken to Twin, and Twin told Pipe how he was going to take of him when he came home. There was nothing Pipe could do from prison. Once the plot to kill Twin hit the streets, dealers such as B-Love kept drug money he owed Twin straight disrespect. Twin told Shog that B-Love needed to pay up if he knew what was best for him. It was basically on site for Twin, but guys were still a bit reluctant to kill him. The mid-level bloods were looking to make a name, such as Roe. Green Eyes, another member, was sleeping with a female who was also sleeping with Twin. He was pillow talking with her, and it got back to Twin that people were trying to knock him off. As a result, Green Eyes was appointed to commit the murder and prove his loyalty to the set. Upon learning that there was an attempt on his life, Twin pulled up to be Love's building and sound view to see what's up. He then took a daring stroll back to Castle Hill. The news of the brave act reached Shog and Green Eyes. The two, along with Roe, joined Pete's cousin who had the car. They tried to catch Twin, but they were too late. The government was building a case on SMM. A lot of guys from New York were still down south getting money, and law enforcement noticed it and began to track them. Eventually, David was picked up. David, that we spoke about earlier, gave up everything he knew about SMM. This included the 9mm handgun he was asked to purchase by Pete, so Pete Cowd used it to eradicate a female witness. That witness would have been twin sister. This would be the beginning of the takedown of SMM. The arrest of Bigger D, who cooked the crack for Pete, would also give damning information regarding SMM. He would tell of Pete's boasting of his murders, including the Carlton Hines murder. Eventually, everything came out. Yarrow Pack, who was hit with drug charges along with Pete, would give the details what he knew of Pete's murders and the establishment of the crew's business infrastructure in Delaware. Yarrow Pack's initial cooperation sitting contained six hours of information. This was no surprise to Pete, as he already felt that with enough pressure, Yarrow Pack would crack. As the government was building a case, the SMM members were planning the twin murder. The idea was to murder twin at the annual Thanksgiving football game. B-Love was to kill Double Mint, Twin's brother, while Green Eyes and Shog would execute the murder of Twin. Mac-11 would let off pop shots to scare the crowd. That way, nobody would see the Shog or Green Eyes amidst the chaos. On the day of the murder, Shog met up with Blue Eyes, Green Eyes' brother, so they could go together to get bullets. After they got the bullets, the plan to rendezvous in front of the 550 building, one of the main hangouts. Shog went to his shorty's crib to get ready for the game. She seen the guns and bullets, but didn't ask too many questions. He grabbed the 4-5 and left out the crib. When Twin arrived to the park with his brother Double Mint, everything was friendly. He asked Rose something to the extent of bringing him home, meaning making him an official Bloods member. He moved around, greeting some of the other players, with E-Man, his bodyguard close by. B-Love was not present, so Mac-11 would take his place to kill Double Mint. 
Before coming to the field, Mac-11 and Shog smoked a spliff on the roof and overlooked the game. Shog had his bulletproof vest on. SMM members, Green Eyes and Total Package were already in position to kill his bodyguards, and others were also on point, watching Castle Hill soldiers who might pose a threat once the gunshots went off. As the game was underway, Shog would play it off, acting as if he was warming up until the opportunity presented itself to kill Twin. The time came, and Shog approached Twin. He fumbled the gun as he pulled it out, and Twin locked eyes with Shog just a moment before. Simultaneously, Mac-11 made his move toward Double Mint. Shog tried to shot him point-blank, but ended up hitting him in the body. The gun jammed as he tried to follow up with more shots. Mac-11 hit Double Mint in the back with a bullet, then started shooting wildly. Green Eyes shot up Twin's bodyguard, E-Man, as he tried to pull out a gun. Green Eyes kept shooting till the gun clicked. E-Man was still alive though. He started pistol-whipping E-Man repeatedly, until Mac-11 finished E-Man off with a headshot. Twin was trying to get away, as Shog kept shooting at him. He would hit Twin two more times, which caused him to collapse into the grass. Afterward, he would run up close and deliver the final blows, empty the clip on Twin. He then fled back to his shorty's apartment in the projects. The police got information from Bigger D, who let them know about the plot and the players involved in the Twin murder. From this point, Soundview was under watch and was hotter than ever with police. X, who ran the drug trade in Bronx River houses, was appointed to finish off Twin had he survived the shooting. X met Pete in Rikers and gained automatic status within the gang, but had yet to put in work on behalf of Pete. X went to the hospital where Twin was taken, but Twin was confirmed dead. Side note, we might do a story on X, but would like to note that he was once in a relationship with Sammy the Bull's daughter, Karen Gravano. He was the subject matter in her portion of the 2021 season of the show, Families of the Mafia. Moving along though. Shog would reconnect with Baby and inform him of the murder. He had a heavy heart for killing Twin, but did what he was ordered to do. Mac-11 made the front page for the murder, and B-Love was on the run in Kingston. Police were looking for one more person, Shog, although they hadn't identified him yet. He would reconnect with B-Love, where they would head south. Two weeks later, B-Love would give in to his desire to see a woman in Soundview. A few weeks after the shooting, B-Love got arrested by cops in the view. In his wallet, they found the note from Pistol Pete, stating that he wanted Twin killed in code. He was hit with murder and conspiracy. Eventually, he would fold and give up information on Pete as well. Meanwhile, Shog was laying low down south at his aunt's. He would move around New York and establish the Bloods in Springfield. He also heard rumors that Double Mint, who survived the shooting was seeking revenge on Shog. He would end up seeing his sound view shorty from New York. Law enforcement would raid his aunt's crib, holding everyone at gunpoint looking for Shog. His aunt informed him via telephone. Shog was on the run. The murder of Twin would cause the split of the alliance between Castle Hill and Soundview. During this time, Pete was sending multiple letters, enlisting members to do his biddings. They would be intercepted by law enforcement and never sent to the intended individuals. After being arrested for murder, Castro, the main SMM supplier, gave up what he could about the crew, including the bounty he put on B.O.'s head. Nelson gave up the info on the business infrastructure. Shog would eventually apprehend it and take into a pain to be transported to New York. He would encounter Pete on the plane, where Pete was happy to see him, but Shog wasn't in the mood. When they touched down in New York, he and Pete were in a transport van where they discussed the situation. Shog, still enraged about his arrest, didn't want to speak to anyone. Eventually, Pete would be housed with Shog, where Shog would introduce Pete to Mac-11. During this time, Roe was getting picked up and hit with federal charges. While Pete and Shog was locked up in Brooklyn, they took over the dorm. Pete was sexually involved with an female prison guard. Shog would eventually confront Pete about twin. Allegedly, Pete said it was just a bad call, and the conversation never came up again. The feelings of exploited and treated as a pawn would press on the mind of Shog. He once encountered Yarrow Pack, who was already cooperating and displayed his disgust toward him. Yarrow Pack let him know that cooperating was the only way out. Pete and Shog would also encounter Preacher, the Black Hand of Harlem, who was also indicted along with his crew. He would also participate with them in a fight against the Latin Kings when the Kings wanted to attack Green Eyes. Green Eyes was cooperating, but SMM would deal with him themselves and not allow Green Eyes to be attacked. 
Green Eyes and Shog would talk shortly after this event. He pressed Shog to cooperate as well, and to at least give up Baby J to save himself. He also spoke of how Twin wasn't snitching. After heavy pondering and consideration, Shog would eventually sit down with law enforcement. At first he tried to give up information they knew already, like how he killed Twin, and Pete ordered the hit. The feds approached him about Baby J, which he dreaded, but gave up what he knew. He would also go on to testify what he knew about Bimo. Pipe would soon be released from the attempt murder. While locked up, he learned that his brother, Ro, had began cooperating. While on the streets, he would attempt to mobilize the new generation of SMM Bloods, which was a difficult task. Although no other crews dared to oppose them, there were some internal beef and shootings amongst each other. Pipe would eventually become a confidential informant on the outside after being approached by law enforcement a couple of times. They would reveal to him a coded letter which he was supposed to have received. The letter came from Pete and was one of the letters intercepted at the prison. Pipe would decode the letter, which detailed Pete's wishes to kill the snitches and their families. Still, at the time, police didn't know that Pipe was still getting money. Although he would tell about where guns were stashed or give information that would prevent potential murders, he was running drugs, bringing in a couple thousand every few days. Meanwhile, X would get apprehended and found with the gun used to kill B.O. Next, law enforcement caught up with Bimo. He gave a struggle but was eventually cuffed and taken in. Nut, who had murdered an innocent man named Tony, was still free. A while back before the indictment came down, SMM members became suspicious when Tony's car, with its tinted windows, slowly drove past them. After the car had driven off, the SMM members retreated to apartments nearby to retrieve firearms to defend themselves. Upon returning to the place where they had originally encountered Tony, the SMM members spotted the car again. They approached it, opened its doors, and some of the SMM members dragged Morton's passenger out of the car at gunpoint, while others pulled Morton out of the car. One one member named Brian was occupied with Tony's passenger, Nut rode his bike up to Tony's car and shot him. Nut and Pipe tried their hand in music and had some success in the clubs. The feds already knew that Nut killed the man, as they were informed by Belove. Eventually Nut would be arrested as well. Baby J was on the brink of success when he was apprehended. He was going legit, but his past would catch up with him. Eventually, Pipe was arrested for his drug dealing, breaching his agreement with the government. He would testify against the younger bloods from the set and talk about what he knew about the murder that Nut committed. Pete was already sentenced by then, and Bimo ended up getting 50 years. X would also be sentenced to life for other doings, along with his brother Elijah, his nephew Michael, and Torres. They were getting money in West Pennsylvania, where a triple murder and other shootings took place in furtherance of their organization. After this, not much is important. Pete is still serving life and some of these guys came home, but were arrested for crimes they would commit later. This about wraps it up though. This was not the full story, but we wanted just a shell. We didn't even detail all the five murders, Pete was charged with more a lot of the shootings that's took place. This story is more detailed in the book, Sex Money Murder, A Story of Crack, Blood, and Betrayal, by Jonathan Green. This story was heavily inspired by that one. Anyway, stay low, and thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, as the comments is going to be crazy for this one.